Good afternoon. My name is Christina, and we are pleased to welcome you to the Washington Labs Academy webinar series. We hope you find the next hour or so useful and informative. We have developed our webinar series to deal with some of the technical and administrative issues that our customers face on a day-to-day -day basis. We recognize that engineering challenges can be complex, and we're always looking for ways to support the technology industry. Before we begin, I want to go over a few housekeeping details. First, I hope everyone is able to see the title slide on their computer. We have muted everyone's microphone to keep the meeting quality as high as possible. A recording of the presentation is underway and will be sent to all attendees. We will go through all questions at the end of the presentation as time permits. A full screen view may be preferred. Your selection at your computer can be done using the menu panel. In the menu on your screen, go to view and then select full screen. We estimate that the main bulk of the presentation will take about one hour and we will allow some time for questions at the end. We encourage questions during the presentation. You can submit a question by enabling the chat icon at the top or side of your screen and typing your question to the host. We'd like to hear from you. You can contact us via phone or email, or you can contact the presenter directly. Send your email to bruce at brucearch.com. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Bruce Archambault is an IBM Distinguished Engineer Emeritus at IBM RTP and an adjunct professor at Missouri University, Rolla, Missouri. He received his BSEE degree from the University of New Hampshire in 1977 and his MSEE degree from Northeastern University in 1981. He received his PhD from the University of New Hampshire in 1997. His doctoral research was in the area of computational electromagnetics applied to real-world EMC problems. He held positions at Digital Equipment Corporation and Seth Corporation supporting product design and EM analysis. In 1997, he joined IBM in Riley, North Carolina, where he is the lead EMC engineer responsible for EMC tool development and use on a variety of products. Bruce has authored or co-authored a number of papers in computational electromagnetics, mostly applied to real-world EMC applications. He is currently a member of the board of directors for the IEEE EMC Society. He is the author of the book, PC Design for Real-World EMI Control, and the lead author of the book titled EMI EMC Computational Modeling Handbook. He has lectured at the University of Oxford for the last 13 years. So without further ado, let me hand the presentation over to you, Bruce. Thank you, Christina. Okay, you should be able to see my screen. So welcome everyone, as Christina said, my name is Bruce Archambault, and um, I will admit that when people read off when I graduated from my various uh, educational activities, I start to feel old. It seems like an awful long time ago when you hear the dates. It doesn't feel so long ago when I just remember them, though. Anyway, what we're going to talk about today is common mode noise in high-speed uh, digital circuits. Um, most of the very high-speed signaling that's going on today in the many hundreds of of megabits and gigabits per second, tens of gigabits per second now, uh, are going differentially. And, and primarily the reason they're doing this differentially is because it improves the signal integrity, the signal quality. Uh, and there's been a lot of confusion about how much that really helps uh, EMI. And so basically, if we truly had a differential signal, then the emissions would be greatly reduced and, and almost zero. But any amount of common mode noise on those differential lines cause significant EMI emissions. In fact, I'd have to say over the last eight to ten years, probably most of the EMI emissions that I've had to uh, worry about in product development has been because of differential cables, differential signaling cables that had common mode noise on it. And so it's a big problem, and, and especially since a lot of this energy is very high frequency, 
shielding and filtering is very difficult when you get up into the 10 and 20 and even 30 gigahertz region. And so any little bit of imbalance is going to re re result in common mode noise. And this could be from in pair skew, rise fall time mismatch on the signals, and, and many more things. And we'll talk about all those, and I'll show you some examples of that uh, today and how to control that. Again, if it's truly differential, then we don't need any nearby reference plane. And so we can think of two wires in space, and current is going out on one wire and coming back on the other wire, and that's truly differential. There's no ground reference if there's no other metal in the universe here. Uh, but as soon as we put this on a printed circuit board, we bring our metal planes, whether they're power planes, ground planes, or whatever we call them, we bring them very close together, and there will be currents on those reference planes, even if we really drive the signals differentially. There has to be because of the fundamental physics involved in electromagnetics. And so to show you some examples of this, I have these 2D cross-section um, cross-sectional views here. And so I've got a pair of microstrips. They're, di they're driven differentially. The one on the left is driven relative to the one on the right. And I've got this VCC plane down here um, below it. It could be called ground. It could be called apples or oranges or Detroit or whatever you want. It really doesn't matter. And you can see that there are some electric field lines coupling from the two traces back and forth. But there are more coupling lines down to that nearest plane. And so there's much stronger coupling from the traces to the plane than there is from trace to trace. And that's because normally on our circuit boards, the way we route our differential lines, they're called weakly coupled. That is, there's very weak coupling between the uh, two traces, most of the coupling to the nearest plane. And you can prove this to yourself. You see the dimensions I used for the width of the traces and so forth, and you can take a simple tool like this. There are some free tools on the internet, or you can, if your company has a tool that allows you to do this cross-sectional impedance kind of thing. You can take these dimensions and put them in there and get the same impedance that I did, and then bring the two traces closer together by maybe 50% and look at the differential impedance. It'll change some. Then put them back where they are, eight, eight mils separating between them, and then Turn, uh, bring them closer to the nearest plane, in this case VCC, um, by a factor of two. And what you'll find out is that the differential impedance will change a lot more uh, because of the closer proximity of the plane than it did when you brought the two traces closer together. And that's, you can see from the, this chart here with the, with the field couplings being much stronger to the nearest plane, you can see that that's why that is. And this is not just true for a microstrip, it's also true for strip line. So here I have a symmetrical strip line placed uh, between two different planes. I happen to label them ground and VCC, but again, they can be labeled anything, it doesn't matter. They're the nearest metal, and so these electric field lines will terminate on them. And again, you see there is some field lines going between the two uh, traces, but there's more field lines going to the nearest planes, both up and down. Uh, regardless of the fact I called one ground and one VCC, they're symmetrical, and, and the field lines are the same. And then if I have an asymmetrical strip line where I might have two routing channels in between a pair of planes, uh, you can see that more most of the coupling lines couple to the nearest plane. There are some cup, coupling lines to the further plane, and again, there are some coupling lines between them. But the nearest plane is going to dominate. And, and, that, and basically, wherever these electric field lines terminate, that's where there's current going to be coming out of the board or into the board, depending on which way we're going. And so even if we drive these perfectly differentially, any one of these three examples I've given you, if we drive them perfectly differentially, I still have currents on those planes that are nearby. Okay. So in, as I said earlier, signal integrity is greatly helped by uh, by differential nets because it, differential nets are pretty much immune to uh, any external noise coming in because the receiver is truly uh, differential. Uh, but however, as I said, we're going to have currents in that reference plane, again, whether it's called ground or power or Detroit, it doesn't matter. Um, and if they're balanced, the traces are equal length, the drivers are exactly balanced and so forth, then the currents in the reference plane are balanced as well. And so if we hit some discontinuity, it's not going to be terribly important. However, the likelihood of this happening is, is basically zero. 
And then if we actually think about this a little bit more, if we go inside the silicon of these differential drivers, what we find out is that these differential nets are not truly being driven differentially. Usually what happens, there, there are some differential ICs that actually drive differentially, but most of them are actually two complementary single-ended drivers that are driving relative to ground. One goes high, one goes low at the same time. And at the far end, the receiver, excuse me, the receiver is differential, and so it ignores any other noise, like I said earlier, and, it, and it's independent of the ground. Uh, but the actual driving of the signals, we're actually driving currents on the traces and expecting the return currents to come on that ground reference um, with these complementary single-ended drivers. Again, if I truly had balanced differential currents in the plane, there's no issue for discontinuity. But as soon as I have any kind of uh, discontinuity, I'm sorry, any kind of imbalance, then I'm going to have common mode currents, and that's going to have all the normal concerns for the return plane to apply, same as signal-ended nets. So here's a, a picture of what we might have on a circuit board. I've got some IC that's driving a pair of differential nets. Uh, I'm showing the, the blue here as common mode current that actually radiates out, or if we're going through a connector to the outside of the enclosure, I'm not showing this, the metal enclosure around the, the product here, but oftentimes our differential cables are either poorly shielded or maybe even not shielded at all, or just poorly shielded. And so any common mode noise will radiate very nicely out there. And in fact, that ends up being a very big concern with uh, many of the products that I've been involved with. So common mode noise is really inevitable because we're not gonna have perfect symmetry, perfect balance. As I mentioned, skew, rise, fall time, mismatch. There's a lot of other things too, as well as uh, amplitude mismatch on these two complementary uh, single-ended signals that are being driven, or just bringing them to the, the differential pair of traces too close to the edge of the ground reference plane can cause a big problem. And as soon as we do this, we're going to cause a big problem for EMC. And also, the common mode noise can increase the differential crosstalk because the uh, the common common mode to common mode crosstalk is going to be high even if the differential the differential crosstalk is low within a connector, for example, by offsetting the, the uh, pins. So if we have mode conversion from differential mode to common mode, we can have common mode to common mode crosstalk, and then mode conversion again from common mode to differential mode. And so overall, the differential to differential mode crosstalk has actually been increased. So I, I, let's get into a little bit of the details here. I mentioned that skew. Skew is basically a delay within the pair of the differential signal. So a small amount of, of this delay, in pair delay, can have a significant amount of common mode noise. And as little as 1% of the bit width can cause significant EMC effects, and you'll see that in a few minutes. As soon as you have about 10% of bit width of the skew, that increases the common mode signal to almost the same amplitude as the initial, sig initial differential signal which is very large uh, by EMC standards, right? Differential signals are often about one volt peak to peak. We know that above a gigahertz, for example, if you have one millivolt of noise on an unshielded cable outside your enclosure, then that can cause uh, you to fail the uh, EMC radiated limits. Well, if I get one volt out of common mode noise because I had 10% of bit width, well, that, that's obviously way too much, three orders of magnitude more than one millivolt, which means that I have to do filtering and shielding to add up to 60, 60 dB, that's six zero dB for three orders of magnitude of, uh, of too much noise. And it's not always that bad, but that just gives you an idea of, the, of what, what we're talking about. So I took a simple spreadsheet here. In this case here, I had a two gigabit signal with a 50, uh, 50 picosecond rise and fall time. The bit width is 500 picoseconds for this particular case. And I in, intentionally injected delay or skew uh, anywhere from 10 picoseconds up to 200 picoseconds. Now, 10% uh, for a 500 picosecond bit width would be 50 picoseconds. Now, when we do differential signaling, we subtract these two signals. And in most of these kinds of delays, signal integrity engineers tell me 
Yeah, the differential signal is okay. 200, 200 picosecond delay, 150 picosecond delay, that's probably too much. But, you know, 50 or 100 picoseconds they can probably live with out of 500 without degrading the intentional signal. But now instead of taking the difference between these two signals like the differential receiver does, let's add them together. And as soon as we do that, we find the common mode noise. And so now what we can see here is that at 50 picoseconds, I've got 400, about 400 um, minus to plus 400 millivolts, so 800 millivolts peak to peak. My differential signal was only one volt peak to peak. Now I've got 800 millivolts peak to peak with 10% skew. And even, um, well, let's see, just 10%, 10 picoseconds of skew. You can see I've got about 150 millivolts plus and minus, so 300 millivolts peak to peak. Oh, I'm sorry, no, that's that's uh, that's 75, so 150 millivolts peak to peak. But remember, our goal was to have one millivolt of noise on the external cable. So if this cable with this noise goes outside the box and doesn't have enough shielding, then we're going to have way too much uh, noise. If I convert this into the frequency domain and look at the harmonics, first of all, you notice that the harmonics are all the odd harmonics. Remember, this is a two gigabit per second um, signal. That means the fundamental frequency is one gigahertz, and normal square wave would have, have the odd harmonics, the third, the fifth, the seventh, and so forth. And that's what we see here. We have the odd harmonics associated with this particular signal. But what's interesting to me is that you notice that the difference between having 10 picoseconds of skew or let's just say 50 picoseconds of skew, the purple block box here, um, we're seeing 14 dB difference. So just controlling the amount of skew you have could make a 14 dB difference um, in the amount of EMI noise you have. So you could go from failing by 7 dB to passing by 7 dB, for example. And of course, if you had even more skew, maybe 100 picoseconds, now we're at 20 dB difference here. And you can see for yourself on the on the other frequencies that while the differences are, are not as significant as they are at one gigahertz, they're still significant. And again, this can make a difference between passing and failing just by controlling the amount of skew you have uh, on a differential pair. And mostly you get the skew from um, trace length mismatch in your differential pair as you go around corners or go into uh, connector pin fields in order to be able to route one trace gets a little bit longer than the other, and that just adds up delay. Uh, two gigabits with a 500 picosecond uh, bit width, uh, a little bit of, of skew that's typical on boards, a few picoseconds maybe, um, not terribly significant. However, at 10 gigabits, 12 gigabits, now we got 16 gigabits. We're talking about 24 and 27 gigabits coming out of some products soon. Now the bit width is much, much smaller. And so a few picoseconds make a much bigger difference. Another way to get common mode noise is from rice wall time mismatch. Not as significant as skew, but it's much harder to control because this actually comes from the silicon itself. Uh, so it's not just a matter of making sure the traces are the same length or that everything's balanced on the circuit board, but it's actually in the IC. And so same sort of thing where I just took and changed the rise and fall time a little bit here, and you see now that I've got uh, this common mode signal, and you notice what's different is I've got a full cycle on both the rising and falling edges, and again, as I have more and more mismatch, I'll get higher and higher amplitudes. They're not as big as what I had with the skew that I was showing a few minutes ago, but still 300 or 100 uh, millivolts peak to peak. Um, is still way too much compared to the one millivolt target I was talking about. And again, in the frequency domain, we can see that we can make very large differences between having very small mismatches and relatively large mismatches. Uh, more than 20 dB, 30, almost 40 dB in some cases here. And so that's huge. And so now when you're selecting ICs and you go to this, look at the specifications for the IC for the differential pair, Looking at what the rise fall time mismatch can be very important to be able to uh, minimize the amounts of common mode filtering you have to do on your on your traces uh, down the road. Another thing is amplitude mismatch. I mentioned that most of the time the common mode signals, I mean the differential signals, 
are really not differentially driven. They're complementary single-ended driven. And so now we can look at that. And so that means that one of my signals is a little bit larger. I'm only talking about 10 millivolts of mismatch or maybe 100 millivolts of mismatch on a one-volt signal. You probably wouldn't even notice this on an oscilloscope, which is what most signal interior engineers use. However, you can see that just by adding them together, I'm getting very significant um, common mode noises. So if I take the 100 millivolt mismatch, I'm down here at about uh, minus 25 to plus 25, so 50 millivolts, okay? It's still way more than the one millivolt target, maybe a lot less than what the skew has given me, but this will be additive with the skew because it's going to be odd harmonics again as we saw before. And so I'm going to get more energy again from the amplitude mismatch that's going to add to the energy from the common mode, uh, add to the energy from the um, skew mismatch to make the total amount of common mode. So uh, another way to get common mode noise. And then another way that I wanted to show you is if I brought my two traces too close to the edge of a, a ground plane, um, we can increase the amount of skew. And so this is the, uh, the y-axis here is the percent of the unit interval or the bit width. And let's just say I've got four centimeters of microstrip, the dark, the dark line case here, and I'm one trace width away from the edge. So I'm as close to the edge as most routing rules allow me to get there. And you can see that depending on the data rate, the amount of skew you're getting, uh, percentage of the bit width, is increasing very quickly. 10% uh, we said was, was a danger point here, and at 15 gigabits per second, uh, we've got there with only four centimeters of trace right near the edge. And if we're, you know, two trace widths away from the edge, then you can see the line is lower. But still, as data rate increases, the amount of uh, percent of the unit interval or the bit width is increasing and causing more and more uh, common mode noise just from being too close to the edge of the ground plane. And again, this is only four centimeters. And so it's, it's a very short piece of trace. A lot of things, times I see much longer pieces of trace that are routed very close to the edge. All right, let's talk about something else that may not seem as obvious as these other things I've been talking about. And oftentimes those aren't obvious either. Let's just talk about going through some vias. So I'm gonna have a, di a pair of differential vias here, the signal vias, the, the gray vias, the top view and the side view. And I'm gonna have a ground via at some distance away. So the ground view via is uh, placed asymmetrically, asymmetrically compared to uh, the signal vias. And when we look at the effect of the distance of that ground via to the amount of common mode um, noise that's generated, what we see here is that as the ground via is closer and closer and closer, say only 50 mils away, that gives us the most amount of common mode noise that's been created. And so we can look here and say at 10 gigabits, or 10 gigahertz, I should say. We can look at this and say, well, that's minus 40 dB. Well, yeah, minus 40 dB sounds like a small number, but remember, if my signal was a one volt signal going through there, minus 40 dB is only two orders of magnitude, so that means I'm gonna have 10 millivolts of noise created just in the vias going between one layer and another layer uh, because of a ground via that's too close, okay? So all these things add up and, and give you more and more skew. In, in the previous example, I was only going through one layer. Now I'm going to go through a thicker board that has many different layers, so 11 planes, and these numbers have, have actually increased. They're starting to round off, and that's because of the simulation tool I was using. But in real, in real life, in, their physics are that these would continue upward. And so the same line at 50 mils is getting close to minus 20, which is one order of magnitude. And now my one volt differential signal is gonna give me 100 millivolts of common mode noise just from going through from the top to the bottom of a board to going through 11 planes and uh, uh, a pair of vias with a close by uh, ground via. So this would tell us that we don't want our, any ground vias closely close to our uh, differential vias unless they're symmetrically placed. Now, the first thing you might say is, well, I'll just put them far away 
because then those numbers are really small. You know, if I go back to the previous chart, you know, if I'm if I'm at uh, three inches away, then look, I'm way down here, more than minus 80, about minus 80, I guess. Yeah, about minus 80. Um, and that's certainly true for this case. But remember, if we have common mode noise from some other source, for example, the rise fall time mismatch, in pair skew, uh, too close to the edge of, of the ground plane, the common mode noise currents have to get back across the gap that these the ZZs represent. So this other source of common mode noise needs that ground via to be close by. Otherwise, it's going to have to spread out and return through the differential, I mean, through the displacement current um, uh, between the two planes. So we don't want the, the ground vias to be far away. What we really want is the ground vias to be placed symmetrically. So here's a, a real example from a real board where we had a pair of signal lines here. The initially, the ground via was up here in an upper place and obviously asymmetrically placed. And when we moved it from asymmetrical to symmetrical here, so same distance from the two signal lines, you can see that the, the measured common mode noise actually went down by about 40 dB. And that's very significant. 40 dB is two orders of magnitude and uh, very significant just by moving that via. Uh, as, again, as I said, this is probably not uh, intuitively obvious to most people. So we did a study where we actually looked at this in, in more detail, trying to um, look at the effect of asymmetry and symmetry. So I've got the two signal vias here, signal one and two. And I'm actually going to be looking where port three is over here on the right. I'm actually looking just at the noise between the two planes. As I go from very asymmetrical with my ground via at 90 degrees to perfectly symmetric, with my ground via at zero degrees. And basically, we get a chart that looks like this. I'll explain a lot of curves on here. But the, the blue colors, the cooler colors, are the ones for the, uh, the mode conversion. And so you can see that when I'm perfectly symmetrical, grounds at zero degrees, which was as good as it gets, I basically have zero amount of common mode noise. I'm down here at minus 120 down at lower frequencies and minus 100, minus 90. There's basically nothing. I'm in, down in numerical noise at this point. However, just going from zero to 15 degrees, I jump way up here. And by the time I get to, to the, the worst case of 90 degrees, I'm, I'm up here at about minus 50 to minus 40, depending on the exact frequency that I'm at. So again, that little bit of asymmetry makes things get really bad fast, and still it continues to get bad uh, until you're pre pretty much as bad as it gets. In fact, in this chart here, you're seeing 75 degrees or 90 degrees is about the same. If I go back to the picture, 75 and 90 are way up here. And so we really want that via to be symmetrically placed and not as asymmetrically placed even a little bit. The, the orange and reddish colors, that's the common mode noise that's being generated between the planes based on the um, uh, driving the, the, uh, the pair of vias common mode in a common mode fashion, where these other blue and, and darker colors are, I'm driving differentially and making the common mode noise. So this is a, you know, if we have common mode noise, as I was saying before, we want that ground via to be close to the pair so that this noise doesn't get, this noise doesn't create uh, noise between the planes that can cross talk onto other vias and so forth. But we also need to worry about the mode, the, the common mode noise that we're creating from just the asymmetry. Now, if we had two ground vias, um, we have two signal vias, I'm going to fix one ground via and rotate the other one. Uh, perfect symmetry being when ground one is up at the top and ground two is, is down here at the bottom where it says 100% symmetrical. And we can look at the same sort of thing. And as you'd expect, depending on the amount of symmetry, the, the worst case symmetry is giving us the highest amount of, of common mode noise. 
and the best symmetry is giving us the least amount of common mode noise and speed. This is, a, again, differential port into the cavity port, which means noise between the power and ground plane pair, or a pair of ground planes, however you want to think about that. If I look at different distances here, the previous chart was for 80 mil distance out to the ground via, now I'm going anywhere from 60 to 300 mils. And if I've got very poor symmetry, then the best case again is going to be to have my ground via far away. But again, for other reasons, we want that ground via to be close by. The other reasons being other common mode noises already on the differential lines. We don't want that to get transferred into between the planes. When we have very good symmetry, then it doesn't really matter very much whether the, um, the ground via is close by or not. Um, and in fact, if the ground via, when we have very good symmetry, if the ground via is kind of close, we're getting a little bit more noise. But then we can see up here at very high frequencies, once we get up above 8 to 10 gigahertz, it's, it's pretty much not making much of a difference about whether or not we're symmetrical or not. At these distances, these ground vias are still too far away. Now, we took the, this difference and actually looked at what the delta was. How much of a difference could we make if we worried about the symmetry? So it's really the difference of the transfer function amplitude at worst case symmetry minus the transfer function amplitude at best case symmetry for different distances here. And so if I take the first one here at 60 mils at, uh, say, 1 gigahertz right here, I can make a 20 dB difference by changing the uh, location of the ground via from worst case to best case. Or if I come up here to 10 gigahertz um, and my ground via is 60 mils away, I can make about a 12 dB difference in, uh, in best and worst case. Once I get out to 300 mils, then uh, again at 1 gigahertz, I could probably make a, um, oh, a maybe 6 dB difference. But uh, once I get up to you know four gigahertz, I'm basically not seeing any improvement, no matter where I put that, because it's just too far away to to, to matter at that point. But that doesn't mean it's good; it just means it's really bad. And, and no matter what you do, it's not going to make it better. So you need to put the ground via in close, and then worry about symmetry to make sure that you can optimize things. Now. When I was using the, the, um, the two ground vias, I was looking at the noise between the planes. The other thing we can do is just look at the amount of mode conversion right onto the traces or onto the vias. So we have this SCD21 factor here. If you're not familiar with the S parameters in differential and common mode, what this means basically is an S parameter is telling you for S21, it's saying I'm injecting noise on port 1 or injecting a signal on port 1 and how much of that gets to port 2. And the CD part of this means I'm injecting a signal differentially, and I want to see how much is at port 2. So when you take it all together, I'm injecting a differential signal on port 1 and looking to see how much common mode noise is at port 2. So in this case, it would be the top of the V would be port 1, at the top of the two vias would be port 1, the bottom of the two vias um, would be port 2. And we'll go through the same uh, symmetrically, symmetrical um, analysis. And it's, it's no big surprise, we get a very similar kind of result, but the numbers are actually larger. And uh, so again, if we've got perfect symmetry, we've got basically nothing there. But as soon as we have very poor symmetry, then we have a very high amount of noise. Um, in this case here, I'm only at 60 mils away, and at um, you know five or six gigahertz here, I'm already up to minus 40 dB. Again, if I had a 1 volt signal, minus 40 dB means I'm, I'm creating um, 10 millivolts of, of noise on the traces. And if those traces lead to a connector that goes outside of the product, like an Ethernet connector or something like that, then um, uh, I could be having a lot of EMI emissions problems. If I go out to a, a further distance here, 400 mils, all these curves are lower, but the effect is the same, just that the numbers are a little bit smaller by having the asymmetry. But again, having a ground via at 400 mils away means that what other, whatever other common mode noise is on those two traces coming into those vias will not have a return path and will cause other problems down the road. And this just takes the same data and puts it in a different fashion. 
where we're looking at uh, here the lower numbers are with very good symmetry and you see the difference in distances. It, it makes a difference, but it's still they're really small numbers, more than 120 dB down. That's really, really small. Um, but once we get a symmetry of 50% or very poor of 8, 8%, you can see these curves are very, very similar. And uh, so it's not making much of a difference. Once you have poor symmetry, it's poor is poor. Good is good and poor is poor. And there's not many shades of gray between the two, unfortunately. That's really what this is telling us. Now, the other thing that we can do is we can look at the um, percentage of symmetry take the same data and just plot it differently. So now instead of frequency along the x-axis, I've got the percent of symmetry, with 100% symmetry being the best. And the different curves are different frequencies, and I still have the, um, the SCD21 here, the mode conversion on the y-axis. And really what we see here is that at all these frequencies, um, very good symmetry has very small numbers. But once we get down to about 90% symmetry, well, things have gotten bad pretty fast. So the change from 90% to 100% is pretty significant. Of course, once it still gets worse and worse and worse, and by the time we get down to about 50%, it's as bad as it's going to get, as we saw in previous charts, it's about the same. Um, you can see that for some frequencies, it's, it's not as bad. Lower frequencies have lower amounts of common mode conversion. Higher frequencies have higher amount amount of common mode conversion, and really that's because the bit width is is much uh, greater for lower frequencies, and so the um, percent of skew that's included in this from going through this uh, asymmetry is much smaller percentage-wise, so it's a smaller number. But for higher and higher frequencies, this becomes a bigger and bigger problem. And, uh, and again, it's a similar thing for uh, 400 mils distance. So for a given distance, all frequencies are going to have the same impact versus frequency. The best impact is going to have good symmetry. And what, what I actually find is, is if, if I normalize all the curves so that they, basically they're all, at the, you know, all these different distances and frequencies are on the same, uh, are normalized together, you see that they all have the same curve, basically. This is upside down from the previous ones, but it's the same kind of thing. And so it's, it's pretty much frequency independent, except that, as I showed earlier, um, the lower frequencies have less impact. But you can see the shape of these curves are all the same. So if I normalize them together, they all line up on top. And that's really all that chart is showing you. OK. Let's, um, let's start going through multiple plane pairs now. The previous work for SCD21 was just through one pair of planes. So as if I was coming in here in the top, going through these first two planes and then coming out on this layer uh, right here, which might be if we call, if we have signal layers in between all these ground planes here. So the top layer would be layer one, first ground plane is two, then signal layer three here, four is ground plane and so forth. So I come through here, this, whoops, sorry, I clicked, well, I shouldn't have clicked. So I'll be coming out on layer five here. Um, that's what we've been seeing. Let's suppose we go all the way through the board, and so we have many different uh, plane pairs here. And really what we're going to find is that the mode conversion is additive. The more plane pairs you go through, the more distance you go through, the more common mode, mode conversion, the higher the SCT, SCD21 will be. And so that's, this is very similar to the, the, what we saw before. Frequency across the bottom here. Uh, in this case here, I've got uh, poor symmetry, 8% symmetry, V is at 100 mils. Uh, and you can see that as I go through more and more planes, I get more and more common mode noise. I'm up here to almost 20 dB, minus 20 dB. Again, using the analogy of a one volt differential signal, minus 20 dB means I'm going to end up with 100 millivolts of noise from just this one via transition all the way through a board. Um, with this very bad symmetry, and that's that's huge. Imagine how many times you're going to do this on a board. If I have very good symmetry, I still see the same effect. That is, more planes give me more noise, but we're still way, way down here, more than 100 dB down. So effectively, there's really nothing there. Certainly, it's way below what we could measure in the lab. This is all done with simulation, this work here. OK, then looking at this, 
Um, really the same kind of thing, just now having the number of ground planes across the bottom and the different curve colors are with uh, frequency. Again, like before, we see that the effect is minimal or, or less, I should say, not minimal, but less for lower frequencies and worse for higher frequencies. So the higher in frequency we go, the more this is going to become an issue. And, and, uh, and the left-hand one is with a, the bad symmetry, the right-hand one is with good symmetry, and similar kind of thing. Good symmetry shows us way down in the, uh, in the noise. Okay, so the, for the differential vias, the effect of symmetry with a ground via that's in close proximity is very important. It's going to create noise between the planes. It's going to have uh, mode conversion. And even if we have multiple vias, we're going to have this. And I, and I put the point on here, this is important both for emissions and immunity. Now, I've been talking about emissions, of course. However, the, um, the immunity is just the flip side, and reciprocity applies in electromagnetics. And so if I've got some other noise coming in, whether it's an ESD impulse or some RF coming in from, you know, whatever, um, from some radiant immunity test, um, that noise, I've been talking about this SCD21. Well, SDC21 is equal to SCD21. That is, the mode conversion from common mode to differential is equal to the mode conversion from differential to common mode. So now my external noise comes in as common mode and is converted to differential and becomes an immunity issue. And so this is really not only in EMC emissions, radiant emissions concerned, it's also an immunity concern. Now, as I said earlier, there are, this common mode is going to be impossible to avoid completely. We can control it and minimize it, and that's worth doing. Um, there's other asymmetries, asymmetries that can add to the common mode noise. Uh, one, of the, one of the ones that's talked about a lot in the uh, literature is dielectric weave. If you're using fairly inexpensive FR4, the, dial, the, uh, the way the glass weave, the fiberglass weave, is in the goop that holds it all together. Um, might mean that your differential trace, one different, one pair, one trace of a differential pair would be over glass, one would be over goop, the dielectric constant is slightly different, and so um, that will cause skew because if the dielectric constant is different, propagation velocity is different, even if your lines are the exact same length, with the propagation velocity being different, that means that you're going to get in pair skew. Okay, so that's what this is all about. I don't have any examples of that uh, here today because oftentimes what I find is that once you get up to high frequencies where this becomes an issue, you're paying for better dielectric just because you need to have lower lost dielectric anyway. And so uh, the, the weave effects of the fiberglass is not as important. But if you're using inexpensive FR4 for very high speed signals and trying to heat the cost down, then this issue could be very important to you. And as I said earlier, above a gigahertz, one millivolt of common mode noise is risky for passing the radiated emission standards for an unshielded cable. Now, if you've got 10 millivolts of noise and more than 20 dB of shielding, you're probably okay. Um, if you've got uh, 100 millivolts of noise and you've got 20 dB of shielding, you're in deep trouble. You're gonna have way too much uh, noise leaking out. So if you don't have enough shielding, then you're gonna have to have common mode filters. And as you go higher and higher in frequency, getting common mode filters that are effective are more and more difficult to get. In fact, uh, the last time I looked a few months ago, uh, getting something that would not hurt my differential signal if I was going faster than six gigabits per second was impossible to buy a discrete component that would, would do that. And so then I have to rely on shielding. And as I'm sure you know, in order to have good effective shielding at higher and higher frequencies, the amount of openings that you can allow goes down very significantly. So it becomes more expensive and so forth. So it, it, it certainly is um, worth the effort to control all this common mode noise on the print circuit board and at the IC when possible, um, whenever possible. I also have some cables to show you here, some measured data from some cables that were taken a few years ago. And I'll go through those relatively quickly because um, they're all, all the different cables show the same kind of thing. 
And and so I'm going to do this cable skew measurement. Now I don't even have any active electronics. I don't have any printed circuit boards. I'm just going to take, for example, an InfiniBand cable and look at multiple pairs, m multiple differential pairs within multiple cables and look for consistency in the amount of skew that we get. This is an example here. X-axis shows the amount of skew. This is 2.5 gigabits per second, so 400 picosecond pulse width. So you can do the math on what 10% is of this. And uh, you can see that a small amount of skew, say 40 picoseconds, is going to be 10%. And we can see that there's a lot of these cable pairs in this bundle are on the different cables, I should say, because we, multi we measured nine different cables, 24 pairs each. You can see a lot of these cables had much more skew than 40%. And uh, and they were all over the place. And then if we looked at the, this is just a different way of looking at the same thing. Then if we look at the different cables, so I got eight different cables here, and percent of skew along this axis here, and this is the number of pairs that gave me that amount of skew, you can see that some cables, like cable number four here, seem to be pretty good. You know, very little skew, more than 40 picoseconds, which for 400 um, peak a second bit width is not too bad, um, still a fair amount, but, but then you can see other cables had an awful lot, okay? By the way, the specification for this particular version of InfiniBand recommended, didn't even specify it, recommended that the cable skew, the in-pair skew, be less than 120 picoseconds. And so here's 120 picoseconds back on this chart, and so most of these cables most of these, in pa these pairs met that recommendation. There was one that was outside, but since it wasn't a, a specification, that cable was still allowed to be used. And it was okay for signal integrity, but for an EMC point of view, having all these different kinds of cables, you can see that today you pick up one cable, get passing data, and then have to go off and take the thing out of the, the product out of the chamber and throw the cable into a pile of cables and happen to pick up another cable the next day with a lot more skew in it, you could have, an, you could have a, a completely different answer on the radiative emissions just because one cable versus another cable. And when we look at PCIe, you see the same sort of thing. <laughs> Excuse me, I had a cough. Or, and, and again, the different cables have different results. And we looked at SAS cables and had a wide variety of, of skew. And even CAT7 cables had a wide variety of skew. And so this is a common problem. No, it's not just picking on InfiniBand or anybody else. Uh, the cables themselves create skew. And, uh, and so that means that the amount of shielding in the cable needs to be sufficient to control the amount of skew that it has. In fact, uh, I recommend that when you're developing shielded cable specifications for differential cables, you marry or you couple the amount of in-pair skew with the amount of shielding. And if the vendor comes back and says, I can't meet that amount of in-pair skew, then uh, you say, okay, you have to increase the amount of shielding because these things go hand in hand. You can't just take one without the other. And then finally, a few measurements in the time domain just to kind of show the effect of um, what happens to the cables. We took a um, differential uh, BERT generator, and uh, you can see the two ends of this thing. It, it's, the differential signals look pretty good. And uh, if I subtract them, I get this dark blue line here. When I add them, I get this common mode noise. Since this common mode noise is happening on the rise and fall time, it tells me there's a little bit of rise fall time mismatch coming right out of the generator. So I'm, I'm going to be aware of that as I go forward. I can't do anything about that. The generator is doing it itself. Now, if I take a uh, cable, 10 meter cable, and have a skew uh, that I measured at only 1.2 picoseconds, and I look at the differential signal at the far end, uh, or the two, the two halves of the differential signal, you can see that it looks rounded. Well, you would expect after 10 meters of cable, the signal is not going to be perfect. If I subtract the two, I get the dark blue differential signal. If I add the two, then I'm getting something about, um, oh, maybe uh, 70 or so, maybe, maybe 80 um, millivolts of common mode noise. And that's only with one picosecond of skew. 
If I go to 37 picoseconds of skew, another cable pair, you can right away see the two differential halves are not looking anywhere near as symmetrical as they were before. And when I add them together, uh, I get the differential signal, and the purple is the differential signal, I mean, the common mode signal. And now I'm getting about 150 millivolts of noise uh, that's common mode noise just from the cable, just from the in pair skew creation on that one pair. And then finally, going with a case of 100 picoseconds, again, the, the two half signals are not looking very nice. Differential signal looks about the same as the other two examples. Uh, we got a little bit more common mode noise than we did before, not, not too much, maybe 170 uh, millivolts. If I look at this in the frequency domain, First of all, direct from the generator, you see the, this dark blue, and you see all these harmonics. That's that common mode noise I was showing you. And it goes all the way out here to 30 uh, gigahertz or so. But you also see that if I look at the, the purple, green, and, and red are at the far end of a 10-meter cable, you see none of that energy gets very far. That cable is not set up to, to propagate common mode noise very far, and it doesn't. We can also look here at the fundamental frequency when the data rate is 2.5 gigabits per second, the fundamental uh, harmonic is going to be 1.25. And you see that there's very little noise coming out of the generator at 1.25. There was really no skew there. And you see that as I increase the amount of skew to 1 picosecond or up to 37 or 100 picoseconds, the amount of skew on this first harmonic grows. And it does in the third harmonic as well. Not very much happening at higher harmonics. And of course, the rise time you saw in previous charts was so so poor, we wouldn't expect uh, an awful lot. But the other thing you notice here is that just from the cable at, at the fundamental harmonic, I've created 20 dB more noise um, just in the cable uh, from the amount of skew when I had 100 picoseconds of skew. 20 dB is an awful lot in an EMC chamber when you're trying to reduce and, and meet uh, emissions limits. Okay, so um, I'm going to go back to, into the S parameter measurements here. And I, me I mentioned already that uh, the SCD21 measures the amount of differential or common mode conversion uh, and the loss in a 10 meter cable. Now, I'm also going to add in this here the SDD21. That's basically going to, I'm going to drive differentially and receive differentially and see what happens at the end of a differential pair. And the nice thing about this is that it removes the data rate dependence of all the uh, previous measurements I was doing. They, they were all very dependent on the actual data rate. And so if I look at the SDD21, that's a differential um, through, if you will, drive differentially, receive differentially, drive port one, look at port two, 10 meters at the other end of the cable, you see that it really doesn't matter how much skew we have. And you saw that in the differential time domain signals. You know, they all look pretty good. Uh, no matter what, they were all about the same. However, if I look at the mode conversion, the SCD21, driving differentially, looking at the common mode at the far end, you can see that the amount of mode conversion changes quite a bit. And this just kind of puts it into the frequency domain, what we saw in the time domain before. In this particular cables, these particular cables weren't very good at all for anything above about uh, um, uh, three gigahertz anyway. So not much was getting through, but you can see how these cables would react at lower frequencies. So just to, final, just to summarize all this, you need to expect some amount of skew in the differential pair cables. Um, you need to look at the cable specification to see what the specifications are for skew, in pair skew, and then look at the variation pair to pair. And again, I think that you need to understand that since the cable skew is going to create common mode noise, you need to uh, increase the requirement for shielding on the cable depending on the amount of uh, uh, common mode conversion. Uh, and uh, the, the more common mode conversion, the higher the amount of shielding you need just to compensate for that. And these things have to be coupled together. Unfortunately, most cable vendors uh, try very hard not to couple these things together, uh, but you as a uh, product developer need to understand this. And as we go higher in frequency with our data signals, it's going to be more and more sensitive to cable skew. Since the pulse width is smaller, um, the percent of the 
pulse width that the cable skew gives us, because the skew is the same in picoseconds, regardless what the data rate is. So if you know, if I go from uh, a 400 picosecond pulse width with 40 picoseconds of skew down to 100 picosecond pulse width with 40 picoseconds of skew, that relative percentage is much, much greater. So again, small amounts of skew gives us a large amount of common mode currents. A little bit of rise fall time change can give us a large amount of common mode currents. And really, any imbalance discontinuity, whether it's in vias or it's ground vias placed asymmetrical to the differential vias, crossing split planes or whatever is going to, is going to deal with that common mode current. And the cables themselves create common mode current. And so um, we have to take that into account and don't become complacent that is a differential signal, therefore we don't have to worry about uh, EMI problems. So that's the end of my presentation and I can take any questions if there are any. We have a few more minutes. Thanks, Bruce. Um, I have, uh, I count four questions so far. So okay. <clears throat> let's see, first question is regarding skew and radiation. Do cable length resonance points increase the emission levels? Yes. As with any noise that's on the outside of a cable, um, once the cable length start, starts to reach resonant lengths, that's half wavelengths for that particular length, then it's going to be a more efficient antenna. And of course, when we're dealing with high, higher and higher frequencies, the, um, the wavelength gets smaller and smaller. And so at, at these gigabit frequencies that we're talking about, almost any cable length is going to be resonant and be at a very efficient antenna. Okay. Um, <clears throat> question number two, in reference to slide 22, how is amplitude mismatch produced? Oh, that's in the drivers. Um, so we've got two complementary single-ended drivers. So um, if you think about, where, you know, the output of an IC has two, um, totem pole outputs, okay, and so we're going to drive high with one and low with the other, and if the amplitude is mismatched by, instead of going from zero to one volts and one volt to zero volts, it goes from uh, one volt to zero and zero to 0 0.95 volts, that's the mismatch I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and that's very common, actually. Huh. Okay. Um Let's see, question three, what kind of material is used in place of FR4 to avoid weave effects? I'd say the Teflon materials and Rogers materials are the most common ones that I see out there. These are a, a dielectric that does not use um, fiberglass weave, and so it's just a, a constant goop. That's probably not the right technical term, but goop. I like that. Goop, I like goop that. works for me, you know. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, uh, question number four, this is the last one that I see. Uh, do you have an estimate of emission variance by different cables from the SKU? It says that was uh, slide 50. Well, I, I would... Um, well, I, I, let me go, let's see, uh, actually, let, let me go here to answer that question, and I'll explain why. So on this slide here, I'm showing as much as a 20 dB difference at the fundamental frequency um, based on the different cables. Well, actually, I guess it's more like a, about a 10 dB difference based on the different cables. But if I could have a cable that didn't have any skew at all, it could be as much as 20 dB. If I go back to um, one of these other slides here, you know, for example, this one, um, where I'm showing the difference in the different cables, you know, the percentage of pairs with a skew in that range is just telling me that I'm going to end up with, um, you know, more skew if I've got if I've got um, more skew 
then I'm going to end up with more emissions. But relating that to how many dB is for that you know, from cable to cable is very difficult unless we have a specific cable and a specific data rate. So I'm really not able to give a clear answer to that other than to say it can be somewhere between 10 and 20 dB difference depending on the cable and the data rate. Hmm. Okay. Well, um, I think that's the end of the questions here. Um, okay, I guess <clears throat> we can move along here. Uh, before before we go, I want to go ahead and uh, and take the opportunity to make mention of uh, the remainder of, of the group six pack series. Um, you have the ball back. I do. So there we go. Um, so episode five coming up on, on June 3rd, where we're going to learn about the band gap structures. And uh, the last episode on high frequency EMC design is happening June 24th. Uh, Bruce, were there any events that you wanted to mention? Yes, thank you. I'm also teaching a class in um, outside of Boston, Massachusetts on um, in early June. Um, this is going to be print circuit board design for um, EMI control. And um, I'm also going to be, I don't have the dates here. If you go, if you go to my website, brucearch.com, um, there's seminar information there. Yeah, it's the 9th to the 11th of June. Um, PCB design for real world in my control. And then later in October, I'm going to be teaching a class on advanced EMC um, design that includes modeling and simulation as well as uh, advanced topics like electromagnetic band gap and, and using lossy materials and so forth. So um, again, you can go to my website, brucearch.com, and look at the seminars to get more information on all that. So Very thank you. Good. Awesome. Okay, um, and then I'm just going to give a quick few uh, words about other upcoming uh, Washington Labs training. Of course, the on-screen URL connects you to our academy page where you'll find information about our webinars and resident courses, and they're available on a variety of engineering, design, and testing topics. <clears throat> we have, of course, Bruce Sixpack, our EMC design series. Today's webinar was episode four in a continuing series of six covering, you know, the various EMC design concepts. Um, I'd like to mention that episodes one through three are available as recordings. While as previously mentioned, right, the remaining two webinars for uh, Bruce series are occurring a few weeks from now in June. Uh, the wireless device approval, these are scheduled throughout the year. Uh, MIL 461 testing is a series of 12 webinars that cover everything you need to know about testing the MIL standard 461. Session five will be happening on May 20th at 1 p.m. Eastern time, and it's going to cover CS103, CS104, and CS105 testing. And as previous, the webinars one through four are also available as recordings for this particular series. And our product safety webinar series will be starting up very soon, beginning next month. Um, we provide customized training at your place or ours, and webinars are available in multi-part series so you can mix and match them. You may take one session or choose from any combination of available webinars from any multi-part series, or sign up for a complete offering of all the Academy training courses happening throughout the calendar year. So please be sure to visit the Academy training webpage to check out the latest training course topics and dates. Also, we'd like to hear from you with suggestions on future topics that we can present. So before I wrap up, I'd like to check and see if there are any more questions that have come in. And I don't, so I believe this is going to conclude today's webinar. Okay, thank you everyone for your attention and your time. I appreciate it. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to get in touch with me directly. Okay, and from us at Washington Labs Academy, thank you all for attending. And at this point, I will now end the event. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon.